It's like the unsilent start in therapy. So, who wants to start? Nobody does. Maybe we can discuss what it's like having Wednesday away from home. Let's look at my Wednesday. It's kind of dark, kind of camp, lots of mental health stuff. I'm here for it. Ready? Let's crack on. Dr. Kinbar tells me I should get out more. So actually, there's actually some medical merits to that phrase. Says I need to open my mind to new people and experiences. Easier said than done, though. Who am I to argue with her professional cliches? I'm a big proponent of behavioural activation, which is a specific type or specific technique that's used in CBT. So rather than waiting for that cognitive motivation to come first to be able to go out and do stuff and build some more structure into your day, you just need to do it. Feel the benefits from that and use the outcome to then hopefully boost the motivation to do it again. There you are. Okay, so she's just having a rummage around all the dead bodies, is she? Thursday, 7.23 p.m. The body is that of a 50-year-old male. Apparently she kind of knows what she's doing about the start of a post-mortem here, doesn't she? She's got a tape recorder ready, a dictaphone ready. Lacerations and defensive wounds appear on both hands. What remains of the chest and torso indicates a frenzied attack. The subject has been almost entirely disemboweled. A post-mortem is an examination after death that aims to answer the questions of who is this person, um, when did they die, where did they die, how did they come about their death. It starts with an observation of the body from the outside before then doing internal examinations and in some cases then taking uh, samples for microscopic examination of different tissues and then even additional tests like genetic tests, toxicology screening. So starting with your dictaphone, observing what you can see on the outside of the body before even touching it, let alone examining the organs inside, is actually how all post-mortem start. I don't remember this one coming in. Full rigor. You've been dead a while. I guess you won't mind waiting another day for me to cut you open. <laughs> Full rigor mortis. <laughs> It's very difficult to accurately estimate the time of somebody's death because there's so many factors that are involved, but there are some clinical signs that give you a ballpark estimation. There's pallor mortis, which is paleness in the skin that happens somewhere between the first 15 and 120 minutes after someone dies, or because blood is no longer flowing through the skin. You then get algor mortis, which is a cooling of the body that can start anywhere from 30 minutes after someone dies and lasts up until sort of 12 hours after somebody dies. Um, it depends on things like, you know, clothing, moisture on the body, the ambient temperature, humidity. So there's quite a wide range in terms of the timescales. Then there's rigor mortis, which is a stiffening of all the muscles that starts after uh, somewhere between three to six hours after someone dies um, and keeps going and progressing until somewhere between 18 and 36 hours after death. And then you get liver mortis, which is a settling of the blood, otherwise known as hypostasis. So blood gradually settles to dependent parts of the body in accordance with gravity. As I said, though, as much as the courts and police would love you to be able to say exactly when somebody died based on these signs, it's a wildly inaccurate science. Sometimes intentions melt in the face of unexpected opportunity. If this was my chance to get up close and personal with a potential serial killer, uh. how could I refuse? Are you really going to make me ask? Oh, absolutely. So while some people would feel frightened, others can get this sense of voyeurism and intrigue, even excitement at the perceived danger of being someone that they think has done all of these really horrific and inhumane crimes. Kind of a similar mindset and rationale for why true crime documentaries are such a big thing. Our first roomy shopping spree. The dance committee's suggesting all white to match the theme, but that's not gonna fly with us. Well, I have more pressing business than to worry about a stupid dress for a dance I don't even want to attend. Yeah, that, we this driving. looks exactly like the sort of shop that Wednesday would be into. I feel I'll only slow you down. You're a gazelle. I'm a wounded fawn. Come and lose and go run with the pack. I thought we were bonding. This is a good example of two people approaching a sense of companionship, maybe in a completely different way. Perhaps one looking for more of an emotional connection and the other looking purely for practical support, at least for now. Are you collecting more exotic trinkets for your office? Those are souvenirs from my travels. It's how I step outside of my comfort zone. Speaking of which, are you going to the Raven this weekend? In, in the I'm middle of the street, save it for a session. A wild, am I? I look forward to talking all about it at our next session. Good. 
Shouldn't take the patient to pull those boundaries back up though. It's always a bit weird if you see a professional like this out in the wild. It's like when you're at school and you see like your teachers doing their shopping at the supermarket and you think, hang on, that's, it's, they're not a real person. Why are they doing this? I mean, small talk is fine, but doing therapy, like asking about their comfort zones and concepts here, like um, what they're really alluding to is graded exposure, gradually pushing yourself out of your comfort zone um, to try and manage things like anxiety, social relationships, etc. This discussion should be limited to sessions only and the owner should be on the therapist or the professional to ensure those boundaries stay in place. In this case, Wednesday's absolutely right, but it should not be on her to put the boundaries back up. I'm not sure why you're becoming upset. Yeah, that's kind of the problem. I mean, call me crazy, Wednesday, but you keep giving me these signals. It's not my fault I can't interpret your emotional Morse code. Mm. Didn't let me spell it out. I thought we liked each other. But then you pull something like this, and I have no idea where I stand. I mean, am I in the more than friend zone or just a pawn in some game you're playing? I'm just dealing with a lot right now. Emotional Morse code. I love that phrase. I imagine that resonates with a lot of neurodiverse, particularly autistic people watching this. The concept of cognitive empathy involves having an understanding of people's minds and other people's perspectives. How may they be feeling? What may they be thinking? And how does that then influence their behavior and this interaction that we're having and why it's playing out in that way? This is sometimes called theory of mind, how we read or misread people's minds when trying to make sense of their actions. Do tell. You don't care what people think of you. Maybe on the outside that's how it looks, but I don't buy that. Honestly, I wish I cared a little more. I think she cares a lot. You just don't want to let yourself care. It smells like rationalization to me as a defense to say, this is why I don't want somebody getting close enough to be able to connect, because then if they're not close enough to connect, they're also not close enough to be able to hurt me if things don't pan out the way I hope they will. Apparently her therapist feels she hasn't been very open to the process, and their time together has not yielded the results we'd hoped. I'm not a lab rat. Dr. Kimbert and I have spoken, and we both agree it would be most beneficial for you all to attend a family session this weekend. No. I thought that might be your reaction, but I'm certain your parents can see the wisdom in it. Um, not to side with Wednesday, but um, we're only here for the weekend. Family therapy is underutilized, at least in the UK, and it has a fantastic evidence base for a range of different states of mind and range of different mental illnesses. Particularly for children and young people, though I suspect it would benefit anybody that has extensive family involvement in supporting somebody with a severe mental illness. There is an evidence base for it in depression, in anxiety disorders, in eating disorders, in schizophrenia. The rationale is to help each member of that family understand each other better, understand someone's mental illness better and how certain interactions that can happen between members of that family can have a direct effect on the person with that illness but also indirect effects as well. Support around us can be life-saving but toxicity around us can be incredibly harmful whether we realize that's happening or not. Oh come on, what can it hurt? I mean to be honest I've always been a big fan of hair shrinking. <laughs> it's not that kind of hair shrinking mon chéri. <laughs> well. How disappointing. disappointing. But anything for our little girl. <sighs> I've never met someone that refers to us psychiatrists as shrinks in a favourable or complimentary way. The fable is, and I'm going to call it a fable because I've got no idea whether there's any truth to it or not, is that... Um, People felt that their heads were being metaphorically shrunk when they're in therapy with a psychiatrist. A metaphorical version of when tribes would shrink the heads of their vanquished enemies by putting their heads in the tumble dryer or whatever it was. At least they care enough about Wednesday to go to therapy with her. Tyler, come on, please, we've been through this. I'm just, I'm not comfortable dredging up the family past with some complete stranger. You think it's easy? You don't have to be comfortable. I got a lot on my plate right now. It's not about think. comfort. Avoidance is at the core of most of our more unhelpful defense mechanisms. You know, a lot of adverse life experiences, well, pretty much all adverse life experiences, hurt. And humans don't like feeling hurt. It makes us feel vulnerable. Um, we'd rather suppress it and then just move forward. Uh, we fight it or we flight from it. And the therapy is really hard because 
It's about trying to face the stuff that you'd rather not come face to face with. And that can bring up a load of emotions that you'd rather not feel and that really hurt and make us feel vulnerable. And that's as a doctor, that's kind of weird because you think that your job as a doctor is to help make people feel better. But actually, when you do therapy, you often make people feel a bit worse before they then feel better. It becomes a really rocky journey. It's like the old silent start in therapy. So, who wants to start? Nobody does. Maybe we can discuss what it's like having Wednesday away from home. I mean, for me, it's been hard. Good lad for starting. Morticia? Gomez? How have you been coping? It's been torture for us, too. Fortunately, my brother Festa's rag fits two people. Nothing like a good stretch to bring out the best in each other. Kinky. Um. A little bit of the mask slipping there from the therapist as she winced. We don't kink shame in therapy. What was it about that that was so overpowering to the therapist that their moral view was essentially right there for all to see? What were you thinking? <laughs> Sorry, it's just made me thought we need to watch One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Young Royals, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, Ted Lasso as well. Yes. Oh my God. I just, I need more hours in the day and an editor. <laughs> I need an editor. What are these? Brochures? For summer camp. These aren't just ordinary summer camps. So camps for like, can't there be conversion? No need to be dramatic, Enid. You want to send me to conversion therapy for werewolves? It this for your this is pray the gay away for werewolves. Seven weeks in the Balkan countryside and she was howling at the moon in no time, as it should be. Don't you want but converting people to a werewolf? Finally be normal, honey. There is a delusional disorder called clinical lycanthropy, where people have delusional beliefs that they are a werewolf or can turn into one. And delusions are these fixed false beliefs that are held with 100% certainty, despite all evidence to the contrary, and they're a defining feature of many periods or many episodes of psychosis. Yes, I know this is a metaphor for queer conversion therapy. We'll get to that. <laughs> it's decided six weeks at Camp Howell. You'll need to pick which activities. No, I don't, because I'm not going. Not this summer, not Good ever. Good for her, standing if up for I'm herself. If I'm out, then I'm going to do it on my own timeline and not yours. Yes. I just hope that one day you'll finally be able to accept me for who I am. Any form of coming out should be on your terms, nobody else's. I'm proud of you, kiddo. You do you. Just a reminder that queer conversion therapy is still not banned in the UK and it is still happening under various different guises. Could he warn that I was destined to be alone? <sighs> Maybe it's inevitable. It's not though, is it? But for the first time in my life, it doesn't feel good. Which I think is a sign of progress, but then progress from a sort of psychological point of view often is about feeling worse before you feel better. Because it involves being vulnerable. You know, this idea of destined to be alone, trying to convince yourself that connection is futile because connecting and caring with somebody is a risk. It might go wrong and you might get hurt, but there's always a chance it could make you far happier than if you'd never taken the chance alone. My first video looked at clips from episodes one to three. This video looked at clips from episodes four to six, and I've got one more coming looking at clips from the last two episodes as well. Looking forward to it. Let me know what you thought in the comments below, and I will see you very, very soon. Love you, bye.